Our special guest is Councilwoman Laurie Combo of Brooklyn. Councilwoman, welcome to Reaching Out. Thank you so much for having me today. It's an honor. So our audience understands uh, and knows the district that you represent. Yes. You represent the section of, I would say, the Fort Greene area. Fort Greene, Clinton Hill, Prospect Heights, Crown Heights, and parts of Bedford-Stuyvesant. So it's massive. Yes. Um, it's very diverse. It's a dynamic district. Uh, it is also the hotbed of gentrification um, in New York City. And certainly housing issues are our number one um, issue in the district. And so that's where the majority of my time um, is spent in terms of trying to create an equilibrium or a balance in the district. Now, we need to begin our discussion by asking what are your thoughts about what's going on in our city in response to the Michael Brown case, the Eric Gardner case, and of course the unfortunate, uh, and they're all unfortunate, mm -hmm. but the accidental shooting, because that's what everyone seems to agree on, it was the accidental shooting mm -hmm. of uh, Akai Gurley. Mm -hmm. I think that this is a, it's an incredible and a historic and an epic time, and I believe that this is going to be um, the time in which change is really going to be seen. I think, as everyone has noted, the dynamics of young people um, being empowered and empowering themselves has been the most exciting part of this to me because so often when incidents like this happen, it happens for a day, it happens for two days, but this has been seen globally and it has not let up. And all throughout this weekend, um, even last weekend with the march to Washington, D.C., and what we're seeing as far as Japan um, and London, we're seeing that young people are finding that, I believe, through social media, they are connecting in ways that they were never able to connect before, and they feel more of a, of a kinship with the struggles of people all over the world. And so I think that that has been the most dynamic part of it, is that this has invigorated uh, a generation that will now speak for themselves, um, and will lead themselves ultimately. Now, we're, we're, we're taping this in December, mm -hmm. so the, it's going to air early next year. The movie Selma yes. is coming out. 50, yes. 50, we're coming up on 50 years mm -hmm. on the march, the march in Selma, mm -hmm. and it seems that we are now reverting back to that era, I see people marching all over the march in Washington, the marches uh, in Washington Square, not Washington Square, like Washington Square Park, mm -hmm. the march there. And it reminds me so much of what I've heard about in Selma because I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you said social media, I believe we're headed for uh, not a revolution, mm -hmm. but a massive world demonstration to say that we do not like what's going on in this world and in the United States. Well, I think that you're right on with that. And I think that what we're seeing in terms of um, the tragedies that we've seen are in many ways straws that broke the camel's back for so many other forms of racism that are seen um, in every area of society, whether it's housing, um, and we're seeing so many people, as I would say, um, people of color are being moved out of their communities, as I say, via U-Haul, a police car, or through a Hertz. So it's one of those things where people of color are, are dramatically being moved out of urban cities. And so I would say that that frustration bubbles into what we're seeing right here today. So people are protesting for Michael Brown. They are protesting for Eric Garner. They're, they're protesting for Akai Gurley, but at the same time, they're, they're, they're bringing so many other frustrations, um, whether it's from uh, the minimum wage that's not allowing people to get ahead to one of the most segregated school systems um, which exists here in New York City. People are expressing those frustrations and they're expressing them out in the street, on social media, in their workplace. And I'm really very proud in the city council um, that we have united in many ways around action items um, in terms of being not only in the chambers, but also on the streets and also on the bridges as well. And so you're seeing the council um, taking a very proactive role 
Um, and we have met as a Black, Latino, and Asian caucus to begin to formalize a package of legislation that we want to introduce collectively to address many of the issues that we have seen um, as of late, um, and not as of late, but that, but just have been systematic. But now is the time because this is a progressive administration, and if ever we had a chance to pass this level of reform, it's now. What is your assessment of the way the New York City Police Department is addressing what is clearly continuing problems, deadly problems in many communities? Well, I would say that the, the most uh, evident of that um, has been the letter that was issued by Pat Lynch um, of the PBA that discusses in many ways that uh, he's requesting officers to sign off on a letter saying that if an officer is killed in the line of duty that they don't want the mayor or the speaker to attend their funerals. And I believe that that action is creating a level of divisiveness um, and at the same time, it's also getting to the root of the problem in that that particular arm of New York City wants to function in a way without accountability, without transparency, without question, um, without repercussion. And I think that um, this issue is pointing to what the real problem is by the issuing of that letter. And that letter is 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 highlighting for people just how serious the issue is in terms of when we talk about retraining, when we talk about all of those issues, how can we get that level of retraining if inwardly you feel that way? You're still gonna come out with the same result because you're still coming from the same place. Um, I, I speak, I, I'm an artist in that way. Yeah, so your sure. soul is yeah. still, your soul is still feeding a, a similar dynamic. And so, you know, one of the things that I would like to see is not only for there to be a retraining, but, but a fundamental change in terms of with police training that you're able to enter into a situation without it becoming um, deadly. I would like to see more of a situation where um, situations are diffu diffused or in situations um, that oftentimes people are able to come out with their life. And, and I, I would like to see in some of these incidents that I've seen um, that situations like tasers be used. Um, that's something that hasn't really been brought to the forefront, I think, in combination with the body cameras um, would also be. But that's really just the tip of the iceberg. You know, when you're... It, it, Everything that we do is going to have somewhat of a Band-Aid effect because if we're still living in the most segregated school system, people are coming out with racial projections upon graduation. They have been taught that some groups are inferior, some are superior, um, that in many ways certain groups shouldn't function, or if you're coming into my district, if it's an African-American school and it's all African-American, many people that are coming to the district will see that as being an inferior school because it's all African-American, where in reality, schools such as Benjamin Banneker and my district graduate, um, over 90% of their graduates go off to college, the same way with Medgar Evers Preparatory Academy. So we have dynamic schools, but I think that that segregation um, you have people living in separate neighborhoods, going to separate schools, and then coming into work into communities that are very diverse. And this is what happens because they haven't had um, proper introduction and respect for one another's culture. You're listening to Reaching Out. I'm Gregory Floyd, President of Local 237 Teamsters. Our very special guest is Councilwoman Laurie Cumbo of Brooklyn. We're here talking about uh, the issues that face New York City. Let's switch gears and let's talk about uh, the first year because this you're coming up on your first year of uh, being a council person and there are a lot of uh, new council faces. How do you assess what's going, going on, what has happened in the council over the last year? I mean, this is a really, uh, I would say, baptism by fire <laughs> with uh, what's going on in this country and in the city. Baptism by explosives, I would oh. say. You know, it's been an exciting and dynamic year. I mean, it, it it is so, it's such a revolutionary change in terms of the world that I came from. I was a former museum director um, and a graduate professor at Pratt Institute. So for me, as an artist coming into this world, it has certainly been a change. But I'm very excited. There are 21 new members. Um, 
There's a, a strong majority of the members are under the age of 40. It's like the energy is bouncing off the walls. Um, they say that we have introduced more legislation than any other administration. There have even been calls to say, could you slow down? Because they just don't have the infrastructure to handle the level of legislation that the members want to pass. I would say in terms of the budget, we were able to increase the budget in such a way that it allowed so many programs to get funded in ways that they weren't before. And I was very proud of that. And in my district alone, we were able to bring back in $22 million for uh, expansion and development of cultural institutions in my district. We were able to expand uh, Dove funding, and which is a domestic violence initiative, from 4 to $6 million. I mean, it was really a great opportunity. One of the things that I'm most proud of that happened in the council for me, which is something I ran on, is that now in the city council, previously your district received money, as crazy as this is, by your relationship with the speaker and or mayor. So if you voted for what they voted for or you supported their initiatives, you'd get more funding. And if you didn't vote in support or you were, um, I guess, opposing to what they were introducing on many different levels, you'd get less funding. So many members that had suffered under that, that's radically changed now. So every member in the city council gets the same amount of money with there being a slight difference depending if you have more poverty in your district than another. So neighborhoods such as in the Bronx and in East New York and in Brownsville, they are now getting more money than the rest of the members in order to level the playing field and to create that level of equality that people have been talking about. And I would say that is something that happened that has gotten very little attention. It's got no attention. It's got no attention. And very few people know that that's happened. But the effects of districts now receiving more funding where they were severely underfunded before we're not going to quite feel the, the benefits of that for some time because it takes time for neighborhoods that have been systematically underfunded for generations to now automatically be able to catch up to neighborhoods that were overfunded um, on so many levels. So I would say those are some of the things that um, I'm very proud of. I'm also very proud that um, when I came in, 57 senior centers um, and uh, community centers in our NYCHA developments were slated to be closed. And so I was very excited that through the leadership of many of the members, um, including Chair Richie Torres, that we were able to fight to keep not only those 57 uh, community centers and senior centers in our NYCHA developments open, but that they stayed open seven days a week, many of them until 11 p.m. And if they had a basketball court on the weekends, I believe they stayed open until 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning. And in my district uh, in the 35th, it dramatically increased, um, decreased crime. And it wasn't only because the community center was open. That played a big part. The police department was in partnership with us. My office, as well as the cultural institutions in the area, as well as those individuals um, that are into athletics, we did entire wraparounds. So at any given point, you could see me in one of the NYCHA developments in the community center playing spades, roller skating, jumping jacks, showing movies. And this, as a result, um, Ingersoll, which was identified um, as one of the most uh, dangerous pro- places, one of the most dangerous places. Right. Um, we actually had the highest reduction in crime in the city of New York. And I'm very proud of that because I want to reduce crime and create a place where our young people can be safe. Uh, you've been listening to Reaching Out. I'm Gregory Floyd, President of Local 237. Our very special guest was Councilwoman Laurie Cumbo of Brooklyn. Thank you very much for coming on Reaching Out. Thank you. Thank you.